Oh, it's not even PowerPoint. It's uh, it's Prezi. Yeah, actually, People are like, what about Prezi? And I'm like, you totally have to do it. I've converted at least 15 people. Yeah, I learned about it actually from Chris Douglas gave a yes. talk using Prezi here at the Miller Lunch uh, three years ago. Very awesome. Yeah, I remember that. Since then, I've been well, using it too. Absolutely ecstatic to hear that. Um, I wanted to ask you about Prezi. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my goals for using Prezi is you Yep. So schools don't have to purchase PowerPoint, and it's more collaborative with their students. Yeah, I mean, Prezi does want you to pay for it, and, and you do get something. You do get some yeah. benefits if you, uh, you if you pay up. Which, um, yeah. Some classes do, and uh, some don't, depending on their funding. Not a quantum computation. Okay. There you go. I didn't have the title. Sorry. Yeah, I realized I never said. I said. <laughs> After all the, all the introduction, I said, he will explain what all of this means in this talk today. So you can keep your own title. Okay. It was too crazy with all the, the you know, non-functional email systems oh, and everything yeah, yeah, else. Yeah, it was yeah, just yeah, like, that was yeah, forget it. I'll yeah, just yeah. No, I didn't use campus mail at all, so I didn't even realize what was happening. Oh, yeah, you were probably the only one that could receive email. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's lucky that you see him at a different table, or I might have had some stern words for him. Oh, about? Oh, I mean, about a couple of weeks on campus. Yeah. His email where he, uh, he describes the protest was as not non violent, I thought it was really quite despicable. Um, he could say that they were violent, or he could say that they were non, non violent. Don't give us a double Don't give us <laughs> Oh, I was overseas, I hadn't seen the video yet. But he should have just said outright. Yeah. I didn't understand what had happened. Right. I understand the protest was not wrong. Right. The one thing Yeah. 
We didn't know each other very well. After no, we know each other in the wrong building over here. Right, no, that's true. Yeah, we're both about to take that email last night. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> no, uh, so um, let me see. Fortunately for you guys, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff in my talk. Um, what I'm going to try and do, so the title is Knots in Computation, and I'm going to try and provide some of the motivation for the work that I do, but the actual mathematics I do will only appear in at most the last 15 seconds of my talk. So you're, you're fairly safe from hearing about any of the things that we just mentioned in the introduction. So, to tell you about uh, what knots have to do with quantum computation, I have to give you a little bit of the, the, the history of what knots have to do with history in the first place. That, of course, is the uh, Miller Institute logo up there, the, the Miller knot. Um, so let's, uh, let's have some, uh, some historical fiction uh, that sort of provides the backdrop to all of this. So I want to begin, actually, way back in prehistory with a little bit of a digression, but that I think is a a fun piece of scientific history. Uh, this great paper called On Vortex Atoms, written by Lord Kelvin back in, uh, I think, 1867. Let's zoom in and see. So here, yeah, the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, 1867. And so this is back in the days when they, they knew that the world was made of atoms, but they didn't have any useful theory of what atoms were or any, any predictive power based on a model of atoms. They were, but they were trying to come up with something. And so what, he, what uh, Lord Kelvin noticed was that vortices in fluids can last a long time and move around and interact in complicated ways. And so uh, here he says that this discovery inevitably suggests that Helmholtz's rings are the only true atoms. So what he wants to do is build a theory of atoms out of vortices in some all-pervading fluid in, uh, in, in our universe. And so he, he went in to uh, quite a lot of detail in this paper and, and thought out this idea. Uh, here you, you might imagine a, a, a not-theoretic basis for chemistry, which of course didn't turn out. Maybe uh, hydrogen atoms are these little circles, and a hydrogen molecule is two of them connected together. And you might imagine that, the, that there was a whole basis for chemistry, where the, the interactions of, of, uh, of elements are based on the ways in which little knots of, of made of vortices in a fluid could, could link together. And so, inspired by uh, this paper of Lord Kelvin's, uh, oh, uh, yeah, so actually, the, uh, there's, a, there's just a nice picture of a smoke ring over there. And then and Kelman actually went into a fair bit of detail. He knew that what he had to predict, he knew he had to uh, explain the spectral properties of different elements. And so he actually went and thought about the, the vibrational motions of knots and, and really made a serious effort to, to hook this up with, uh, with uh, what was going on. And so his friend Guthrie Tate uh, gave the first enumeration of small knots. And you might think of this as a sort of prototypical periodic table. Of course, it was totally wrong. 
for, uh, this was the beginning of the, of the theory of knots. And I, I really like that the, the title of this paper here is The First Seven Orders of Knottiness. <laughs> we, get to we get to study knottiness. Uh, so of course this got thrown out the window. But, and it then takes more than a century for knot theory to return to physics, but it well and truly did, and that's what the rest of the talk is going to be. So let's have a very, very fast history. Uh, in, the, in that intervening hundred years, uh, physicists discover quantum field theory and start making bad jokes about penguins, and mathematicians decide that it's all too hard. So this is the, the cover of a, of a famous book written by some mathematicians and some physicists, so up here you can see in the 1960s the physicists and the mathematicians all with their brand new exciting ideas being very happy about them. And then in the 90s in somewhat dinkier offices and with slightly greyer hair, they've traded ideas and they're all very upset and confused and can't make it or tail of it. And this isn't really accurate of course, I mean this is a good portrayal of the mathematicians. We've got no idea what the physicists are talking about still. But of course as you might expect the physicists are happily uh, misusing and abusing the, uh, the ideas they borrowed from the mathematicians. So. In response to deciding that quantum field theory was too hard, the mathematicians went away and uh, invented a sort of toy model called topological quantum field theory. And the idea here is that you've thrown out a lot of the stuff that goes into quantum field theory, but you, you hope that this very much simpler model retains some of the salient features of quantum field theory, but is simple enough that we mathematicians can actually prove theorems and, and write papers and, and, and be sure we know what you're talking about. Okay. So all that is going on. And then the condensed matter physicists produce this enormous surprise when they discover this thing called the fractional quantum Hall effect. And I'm not going to try and describe what the Hall effect is or the quantum Hall effect is or the fractional quantum Hall effect. I'm going to sort of jump right to the end of the story. But let me tell you just briefly uh, what sort of thing we're talking about. This is something that you see in two-dimensional electron gases. So I want you to think like two slabs of some semiconductor and there are electrons that are constrained to some interface layer between the two slabs. It's a two-dimensional system of electrons. And you, you do this at very high magnetic fields, like 10 tesla, very low temperatures, less than a Kelvin, and in extremely pure materials that only a handful of people in the world know how to make. And the, the, the really, really amazing thing is that these systems, these fractional quantum Hall effect systems, have an effective description in terms of topological quantum field theory. So this toy model the mathematicians went to go and play with turned out to actually matter uh, in describing these, these condensed matter systems. So here, uh, this is a picture of some of the people who, who uh, first observed this. And over here, there's a, there's a little graph. This is a quite a famous one uh, showing the, the resistivity of this sample as a function of the magnetic field. And you can see there's all, this crazy, um, all these crazy features, these peaks and valleys and plateaus as you change the magnetic field. And this is all reproducible. This isn't just noise. You do this in different samples, different labs, and you really see that something very complicated is going on in these materials. And there's all these different phases uh, where something different is happening. Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time saying, from a mathematician's point of view, what this sentence means, what an effective description might be, and then a little bit about what topological quantum field theories uh, are. So that's the end of the, the history, I guess. We'll talk about effective theories from that. Okay. So in very, very broad terms, what is a quantum mechanical theory in the first place? I just want to say that if you have a quantum mechanical theory, that means that you're saying that for each system, I've just written S over here, maybe out of some particular class of systems, <coughs> you can tell me an associated Hilbert space. This is the Hilbert space of quantum mechanical states of the system. It doesn't matter if you don't know what a Hilbert space is. Just you, you, you're, you're specifying the possible quantum mechanical states of a system. And for each transition between one system in this class and another system in this class, you're meant to also tell me some linear map between the associated <coughs> Hilbert spaces. And so I, I chose pictures here that are kind of not the usual thing for quantum mechanics, just to, to emphasize that I'm really thinking about this very, very abstractly, just at this sort of level of abstraction. So the, the picture here is a chemist blowing things up or something. And so this is sort of saying that a quantum mechanical theory of chemistry would say that if you give me a particular quantum mechanical state of, of these beakers, and then you mix them up and it causes a huge explosion, your quantum mechanical theory will tell me the corresponding quantum mechanical state of this final system. And that's, that's the sort of thing I have in mind. Okay. So with that, 
what, uh, what, what's this word effective mean? So I want to say that often in describing some class of systems, we have a bunch of different theories. And some of them are microscopic theories and some of them are effective theories. So the microscopic theories, the Hilbert space accounts for everything, the positions and momentums and spins and whatever else is, of all of the fundamental particles in the system. Okay? And the time evolution, the, these operators, uh, are just determined by the interactions via, via forces of, of all of the particles in the system. But by an effective theory, I, I, I don't have a good definition of effective theory because I'm, I'm not a physicist. But I just want to say that the Hilbert space um, maybe describes quasi-particles, which are certain excitations of the system, but can ignore the underlying material of the system. So maybe a, a, a concrete example, uh, if, you, if you have a, an electron in a conduction band of a, of a metal, you might think of that, of that as an electron moving in a vacuum. You ignore the background metal, but maybe you have to think of that electron as, as having a different mass than an honest electron does. You might think of that conduction electron as a quasi-particle. It's not a real honest particle, but it's useful to describe the system in terms of, in terms of those particles. Okay. So... The, the point about microscopic and effective theories is that at low energies, for example, in cold condensed matter systems, you ought to expect that there are useful effective theories that let you describe what's going on. Maybe in high energy physics, you've just got to deal with the microscopics and reality is reality. But in some systems, you ought to expect that there are good effective theories that, that sort of ignore the fine detail, in particular, low energy systems. Okay. So... How do we get good effective descriptions of systems? So there's this idea of renormalization. I'm really stepping on thin ice here. I don't know what I'm talking about at all on this slide. But the mathematician's view of this is that uh, there's this process called sort of the, well, the renormalization group, which sort of lets you integrate out the fine details in a description of a system. And from one description of your system, you uh, obtain other sort of more effective descriptions which pay less attention to the fine details. So this diagram here, you're meant to imagine that each point in this plane here is some, is some theory describing your class of systems. And the blue arrows are saying, let's ignore more and more fine detail as we follow along the blue arrows. Okay? Now, there are some very heuristic reasons to expect that the fixed points of this renormalization flow, that is, once you've integra integrated out all the fine detail on this, there's nothing more to do, then those fixed points there should be, should be topological theories. And by a topological theory, I mean one that ignores all the geometry of the system. If you scale it up by a factor of two in one direction, nothing changes. If you stretch it, nothing changes. The, the, the theory can't make any reference to the geometric properties of the system. You'll, you'll, you'll see a concrete example. Okay. So there's this idea that we have this heuristic for producing effective theories for macroscopic ones, and maybe the fixed points should be topological theories. Now, d doing this in practice and making that, that big idea concrete is hard work. And in certain cases, you can, you can do it explicitly, but it's hard work. So the, the, the main thing that I want you to take away from this talk, if you only take away one sentence, is this, is this one at the bottom. That in systems where you expect that, a, that, that effective theories are going to be useful and where you expect that those effective theories might be topological, you can just go and guess what the possible topological theories are. You don't have to start with the microscopic often, and from those derive an effective theory. You can just guess the endpoints and then go back and check that they actually correspond to that. And that's, as mathematicians, what we're going to try and do. We're going to hope that the physicists are caring about situations where topological theories matter, and we're just going to guess the endpoints of, of this process. Okay, that's effective theory. Okay, so putting together all of that. Let's start uh, thinking about topological theories in two dimensions that might explain something about the fractional quantum hall. So what's the setup? So I've got to tell you what class of systems my theory is going to describe, and then I've got to tell you what the Hilbert space is. And then to specify a particular theory, I need to show you the Hilbert spaces and the, and the maps associated. So what's a system? Well. It's going to be a little puddle, a two-dimensional puddle, and maybe it's got some holes in it, and maybe there can be some extra markings on the boundary called quasi-particles, but let's ignore this. It's just some puddle with some holes in it. So what you should think here, you have this two-dimensional system of electrons and this strong magnetic field, but maybe the magnetic field is only strong enough in a little region 
for the, the fractional quantum Hall effect to show up. And that's our puddle. And maybe there are defects in the crystal, or maybe intentional defects we've added where the, the, this interesting phenomenon isn't occurring, and that's forming those, those islands. In there. So a, a theory uh, in this setup has to, for each one of these puddles with defects, has to give us a Hilbert space. What are the sorts of transitions which are, uh, a topological field theory in two dimensions has to, has to give us? Well, maybe if we change the shape of the puddle in some way, we want to know what happens in the system. So what are some things we could do? Well, we could braid two defects around each other. So this is sort of a, a three-dimensional picture where time is, is going up. You could think here, sticking your fingers into two defects, or maybe sticking your atomic force microscope into two little defects, and physically moving, moving them around each other in a sample. Or similarly, you might work out how to, how to move two of these islands together and collide. So what we, our responsibility here, if we're going to specify a theory of these things, is to get Hilbert spaces for each one of these pictures, and maps between those Hilbert spaces for pictures like these. OK, let's start this by giving an almost trivial example of one of these theories. So the, 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 quantum, the quantum mechanical states of one of these puddles is just going to be closed strings drawn in the puddle. So here I've drawn, here the, the, the black is showing the, the puddle, and the red is showing the strings. So here's one quantum mechanical state, just a string around that hole. And here's another one, the string that goes around both holes, and a little string inside, and a little string outside. But I'm going to also impose certain relations, saying that some of these quantum mechanical states are the same as certain other ones. And these relations are summarized here. The first one says that a circle equals one. That is, I can remove one of these little closed circles, and it doesn't change the, qu the quantum mechanical state that I'm talking about. I'm just declaring that this picture and this picture without that guy there are the, are the same thing. They're the, at the same state of the system. And the other relation I want to impose is that I can reconnect the red strings. Anytime I see two red strings next to each other, I can connect them up the other way, and that also has to represent exactly the same state of the system. Okay. So it's easy. Well, you can go away and think about it. Maybe it's not immediately easy. But you can see that the Hilbert space that we're describing here is 2 to the number of defects dimensional. The defect in the number of holes. You, you can see this, well, given a picture like this, each one of the defects, you can ask, are there an even number or odd number of strings surrounding it? So in this picture here, there's an even number of strings surrounding that defect, but an odd number of strings surrounding the other defect. And you can think about these relations, and you can see that any two states which have the same sequence of evens and odds here are actually related by a sequence of these relations. Okay? So this is the argument that this Hilbert space I'm describing has a dimension 2 to the number of, of defects. Now, it turns out, uh, once I've described my quantum mechanical states by some, some pictures in the puddle and some relations on those pictures, then actually the, how the braiding works and how fusing works and so on are actually all determined for me. I have no more choices to make uh, in, in how that goes. And it turns out in this system that the braiding isn't very interesting. So suppose that I, I stuck my fingers in, into these two holes here and dragged them around each other. All that it does to this state is drags the strings along with it. Okay? So if I take those two defects and turn them around each other, that string around this hole becomes a string around this hole. And in particular, that means that in this example, the two different ways of pulling the two defects around each other, taking one above the other or taking it below the other one, give us exactly the same linear maps over in the quantum mechanics. And so in this sense, the braiding is trivial. We can't see which way around we, we took things. OK, so that was a, what's meant to be an easy example of a topological field theory in two dimensions. And we, we investigated the braiding and learned that it wasn't very interesting. So now let's go on to a, a really exciting example. But it's also somehow just the, very, the, the next example. So here, uh, the states are a little bit more complicated. Instead of just having strings in the puddle, my quantum mechanical states of the system are trivalent graphs drawn in the puddle. And again, modulo some certain relations. So it doesn't really matter what these say. The first one is just saying if you see a closed circle, you can remove it for some number. That's 1 plus square root 5 over 2 is the golden ratio, which is why this thing is called the golden theory. Let's just remember that in quantum mechanics, we have linear uh, our, our spaces of states are vector spaces. This is just saying if you remove a circle, the, that state vector is equal to the golden ratio times the state vector without that circle drawn in the picture. And some other relations that let you simplify and modify 
these trivalent graphs in, in various ways. Okay. This time, when we go away and investigate how the grading works in, in this theory, we discover that it's, that it's interesting, in, indeed so interesting that it deserves to be called universal. And, and this is the sense that I mean. So say you've got the Hilbert space associated to, to a puddle with some number of defects. Okay, this is some finite dimensional Hilbert space. And if you give me any unitary operator, any linear operator from that space to itself, that is any possible way that the quantum mechanical states could be transformed, then I can go away and find some braid, some way of rotating the defects around each other, so that my braid approximates your unitary operator as closely as you care. Okay? Now, this, uh, this explains now how, how knot theory has finally returned to physics. Uh, the, the, if, you, if you show me some particular braid here, moving the defects around each other in some way, we can work out the, uh, the, the operator over in quantum mechanics that, um, that is given by this braid by taking some particular evaluation of the, the Jones polynomial knot invariant. So you take a braid like this and imagine gluing the top to the bottom. Now it's just some closed tangle of string, some knot. Okay? There's something invented by my host here at Berkeley, the, uh, called the Jones polynomial, which turns such a braid into a number. And those numbers, those knot invariants, are determining all the quantum mechanical behavior. Okay, so what's the good of all of that? Well, there are two fantastic things about the Goldman theory. First of all, it really exists. This isn't just a toy example for mathematicians. It's really there. It's right there. It's the 12 fifth state in the fractional quantum ball effect. That is, uh, using this description I had above of the Hilbert space associated with puddle and so on, really gives you useful predictive power about the 12 fifth state. This is a, a picture of, a, of an actual device that people built in order to verify that the, the braiding I'm describing, uh, um, that I described in that theory, really is what we see in the, in, the, in the physical system. That experiment maybe isn't quite as conclusive as we might want it to be. That's the intention of that device. Okay, so this thing I've been describing actually exists in lab bench tops as well as in mathematicians' dreams. What else is it good for? Well. It, it gives you a universal model for doing quantum computation. So I don't really want to go in at length to what is quantum computation, but let me give you just a very sketchy view. So if, if you're in the business of quantum computing, then a computer scientist will come to you and say, if you want this particular problem solved, you need to take this unitary operator that I'm giving you now, and you need to, you need to implement it in some, in some physical hardware, and see what it gives you applied to some particular quantum mechanical state. And if you tell me the answer from applying this unitary to this state, then I'll be able to extract the answer to your computational problem from that answer. So the problem from, a, from an engineering point of view is to take a unitary the computer scientist gives us and implement it very accurately in hardware. And so this is the idea uh, in these topological systems. We take the unitary the computer scientist gives us, work out some braid that very closely approximates that unitary, stick our fingers into the fractional quantum Hall effect device and move the defects around each other, and we, we see that unitary uh, being, being implemented. And the really exciting thing is that this is very uh, error-resistant. That is, if we're clumsy and we stick our fingers in and instead of just moving the defects smoothly around each other, we do it in some haphazard way where they jiggle around and we, we screw up. As long as, we, as long as they go around each other the right number of times, then the unitary is exactly the one we expect it is, and it's, com and it's sort of completely protected from the, 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 the microscopic noise in the system. Uh, and this whole approach of trying to build quantum computers by implementing unitaries uh, in, in fractional quantum Hall effect devices is, is work in progress by the people down at, uh, down at Station Q. Okay. So the golden theory really exists, and it might be really, really useful. Well, that's all very well and good. What can we as mathematicians do? Uh, well, the idea is that perhaps we can predict other possible topological states that physicists might then discover in, in condensed matter systems. So, so far, not very many of these topological states have actually been observed, uh, but more and, well, hopefully more and more will be discovered. And we think that maybe the physically relevant parameter, that is, the parameter that maybe 
indicates how likely it is for a given theory to show up one day in the lab, is, is, this, is this parameter the, 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 the loop value parameter. In the two theories I showed you, that loop was either equal to 1 or equal to the golden ratio. And it's maybe plausible that the theories with small values of d are the ones that are actually going to show up in condensed matter systems. And the really, really surprising thing from the last couple of years of, of work on this is just that there are, incredibly few, there are incredibly few examples. If you specify a value of d, a few years ago we might have expected, oh yeah, there are tons of topological theories with that, with that value of d. And what we've been finding is that there are actually very, very few. And so this whole scheme might actually be plausible to be able to go back to the physicists and predict what, what comes next. So uh, this slide now finally has some of the mathematics that, uh, that I've been doing, which is roughly a, a sort of census of, for various values of d, what are the possible topological quantum field theories in two dimensions? And we now have, for small values of d, sort of a, a nice description. For some particular values, this form, 2 cosine pi over n, that it's just a small finite number. And I was talking about the n equals 3 and n equals 5 examples earlier. Then there's some infinite family. And then there are uh, some more sporadic cases a few steps higher up. And, and we're, we're gradually working through this, understanding all the possible small topological field theories in the hope that, uh, that the physicists will, will then go and find them for us. And so that's field theories in two dimensions. Back to a big picture of a knot. Uh, I'd like to thank my host, Vaughn Jones, here, who's, uh, who's been great, the Miller staff, especially Kathy, and the, uh, the whole Miller community for a really great three years here. I'm off to Australia next year. You should come and visit me. See kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's a long story. Uh, um, so, uh, Vaughan Jones's um, big initial contribution to this subject back in the 80s was to show that there's sort of a, um, a discreteness phenomenon, that there's actually a, a, not all values of d are possible at all, and there's this discrete spectrum of, of values. And so, in particular, he showed that below d equals 2, the only numbers you can have are these 2 cosine pi over n. And then what we've discovered in the last couple of years is this discrete spectrum actually continues above. Um, and most of the results that we have that, um, that show that you have this discrete spectrum are actually kind of number theoretic results. But at first I have nothing to do with quantum field theory whatsoever. Um, but then there's sort of a second half of the problem. Once you've used some number theory to get down to a very small set of candidate results, you then need to go and sort of construct explicit examples like I was showing you sort of that golden theory with diagrams and relations and so on to see the different values connected. Number theory, surprisingly enough. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, what's the way to say it? So, people have shown that um, to BQP is what the, the computer scientists say for sort of the standard model of quantum computation. And so, what they've shown is that. Um, evaluating the Jones polynomial of a knot is sort of complete for BQP. That is, any problem in BQP can be encoded as take this particular knot and compute its Jones polynomial. Okay? And the size of that knot grows polynomial in the problem size. Okay? In particular, the size of the gray as well, the number, the number of crossings you see in the gray. And so the one way to think about it then is since evaluating the Jones polynomial is complete for BQP, and these particular systems give you a, a hardware mechanism to, to evaluate the Jones point if you've got something that, that deals with all of these things. And I, I don't know the, the particular numbers, um, but... Yeah, so polynomial... So it's, it's, it's exactly what we want. I don't know what the polynomial looks like and what the, what the constants are that are done there. So is it possible to propose extensive for more complex systems than the same as the real world? Oh, yeah, no, there's, 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 there's lots of complicated structures like that. Um, and, and in particular, there are ways that you can add these things together, and ways you can multiply these things together, and the values of D add and multiply. So there's a very good structure. Uh, so we're just trying to investigate the sort of the, the 
very important for the spectrum. So we know that when you go to high values, then this will become an impossible problem because we don't have any time to give a complete classification. Can you perhaps then decomposition to a more complex system? It would be lovely, but at the moment there at the moment there are plenty of things, plenty of examples that we have which we would like to it look like they ought to be decomposing in a small thing because we don't have construction. <laughs> yeah, so um, this, is, this is Prezi. Um, you can just go to Prezi.com, P-R-E-Z-I. -E um, I learned about it with Christian and Skate his Miller talk two or three years ago, <laughs> and it's Prezi as well.